Now, as we know, since the COVID-19 crisis struck, corporates have found themselves in urgent need to boost cybersecurity operations. As legions of employees suddenly found themselves working from home, there was a need to establish secure connections of newly minted remote workers. For the next First Leaders series of the day, we are pleased to welcome Nikesh Arora, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Palo Alto Networks, to talk about the evolving needs and major shifts in cybersecurity. Guiding the discussion will be Deborah Young, the RegTech Association's Chief Executive Officer. And without further ado, let's move on to Deborah and Nikesh to get started in exploring more about the cyber security space. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you and welcome to you all from Singapore, Australia and the US or wherever you are uh, today. Uh, thank you to the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Singapore FinTech Festival organisers and their sponsors for inviting us uh, to be here with you today and for inviting me to moderate this session. It's uh, truly an honour. Um, I'm Deborah Young, the CEO of the RegTech Association, and it's my great pleasure to be moderating this fireside chat with Nikesh Arora from Palo Alto Networks. Nikesh joined as the chairman and CEO of Palo Alto Networks in June 2018. And prior to that, he served as president and chief operating officer of SoftBank Group. Prior to that, he held a number of positions spanning 10 years at Google, including Senior Vice President and Chief Business Officer, President of Global Sales, Operations and Business Development, and President of Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Prior to joining Google, Nikesh held the role of the Chief Marketing Officer for the T-Mobile International Division at Deutsche Telekom, and he was also Chief Executive Officer and a founder of T-Motion PLC. A uh, very warm welcome to you, Nikesh. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, my, my thanks as well to the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Thanks. I think the things that uh, link uh, you and I, Nikesh, is, is this desire that we have to build trust and to have security and delivering this to organisations who can make um, the world a safer place for us all. Um, and uh, we were just discussion, discussing before the session is that your mm -hmm. scale and mine are, are very different. You as the chair and CEO of Palo Alto Networks with 8,000 uh, employees, um, your mantra to deliver security without compromise, and myself as a CEO of a non-profit uh, RegTech association with two employees, um, but representing a community of 150 organisations accelerating adoption of RegTech to bring also trust, um, productivity and efficiency. And so despite the differences in our scale, um, I think that there are certainly ties uh, that bind us um, today. Um, so I wanted to frame our discussion around a few core themes as we attempt to unpack the theme of today, and that is what are the major shifts and how is cybersecurity um, evolving? Um, and the first one was uh, to touch on global digitisation. Um, how are businesses progressing in prioritising cyber? Uh, a, little bit, a little bit about uh, Palo Alto Networks as a business and what your response has been to COVID-19 and the pandemic. And I'd like to finish, if we have time, um, to talk to you about your insights around innovation and whether you think that there is enough being done. And hopefully we'll be able to um, get through all of that and then um, have some great uh, Q&A as well. Um, so let's get started. Um, so as I've just said, you know, your work and mine, I think, have been anchored in trust and security. And both right now are in high demand, I think, um, owing to the uh, pandemic and the increase in global digitisation. Um, you know, cybersecurity and protection, uh, in particular as organisations have had to pivot to remote working, uh, hybrid work practices, so some people in the office, some people at home, and a huge increase in the amount of data traffic flowing around the system. Uh, with that as kind of a bit of a backdrop, in, in your mind, what are the major shifts right now in, um, in, in cyber as you see them? 
Well, Deborah, as you can imagine, you know, the, the trends in cyber are obviously driven by these trends of global digitization. And I've had the privilege of being associated with the world of the internet uh, from the days of, of Deutsche Telekom, where we were focused on connectivity, where there were days I remember we didn't have mobile data access wherever you went and you'd have to go look for a Wi-Fi spot. Today, all of us carry a mini computer in our pockets with access from anywhere in the world. So clearly that trend is upon us. But what has happened in the last 15, 20 years is that we've gotten so accustomed to having access at our fingertips, data at our fingertips. And what's fascinating is that the pace of innovation has increased. Today, you know, we can build applications very quickly to make things happen. And in the past, we were too busy trying to get the basic infrastructure, basic building blocks to work. And what the pandemic has done, interestingly, Deborah, is like, as I've said, it, it's basically made 100% of many businesses' revenues online because the physical part has been impossible. You haven't been able to walk shop into a mall, so you're relying 100% on your ability to serve your customers in a digital fashion. And that's actually accelerated the space of digital transformation, obviously creating uh, risks from a cybersecurity perspective, because now you've got to make sure that your infrastructure is up and running and doesn't have any exposures or risks. So we are seeing seeing both those things happen at the same time. And I think, but I think uh, the next decade is going to be the golden decade of tech, because you know, this, this space has continued. People who were reluctant adopters of these technologies are now embracing them because they're the most vulnerable parts of our society. We have to be very cautious and careful about stepping out given the pandemic on a global basis. So we've got everybody in the world who wants to be digital first to be able to just survive in this pandemic. Yes, yeah, indeed. No, I couldn't agree more. Um, and and in your mind, how are businesses pr progressing to my earlier point about, you know, is this a global business risk or is this an IT problem? And do you think that boards and executive teams um, actually have their head around how they're prioritising it and has that gone, you know, has that actually gone up in their estimation and in their business planning, in their in their strategic planning? I think so, Deborah. What's happened is that, you know, in the past, you know, five or six years ago, cybersecurity was an element of the IT strategy. You were going to build out an IT strategy, you need to make sure that security was a part of that strategy. But <clears throat> as we've noticed, in most organizations, you know, data is the new gold. You know, you want to make sure that you have Lots of data about your customers. All of us are transacting online, whether it's a financial services organization, whether it's a retail organization, whether it's a Google or a Facebook, they're all ingesting tons and tons of data about us as consumers. They're processing it to give us better services. You know, Hopefully, they're giving you a better experience and a more customized experience by, by being able to ingest and process that data. Now, the moment you are custodians of my data, the moment you're interacting with me, you've got to be very careful about making sure my data is protected. And towards that end, I think every organization has witnessed the costs of not protecting and handling our data carefully. And this has been evident in the variety of breaches that have happened around the world, whether customer data has been stolen or financial processes have been intercepted. So from that perspective, I think there is growing awareness in organizations about the need for not only be technologically advanced, not only be able to write the digital bandwagon, but also to make sure that whatever you're doing is done in a secure way. So I think it is it is getting on the top of the board agenda, it's getting on top of the senior executives agenda. And what's happened is with the pandemic, as I said, 100% of your revenues are online, which means you call your CIO and say, listen, don't mess this up. The whole point is that you've got to be able to take us down this journey. You've got to be able to increase capacity. You've got to make sure that we survive through this without any breaches, any attacks. So yes, that's definitely, definitely top of mind and top of the agenda uh, as part of the digital transformation. Yes, indeed. I mean, if you if we just reflect back, we couldn't have believed a year ago the speed at which organisations had to change and pivot uh, literally overnight. Uh, quite yes. incredible. Quite incredible. Um, so wh what about, what does a framework for the future look like for businesses tackling their security as their, you know, workers are more distributed and as more and more services and data are, are, are going digital and as the attacks also become more sophisticated, you know, how can organisations prepare? I'm sure there's a lot of people on the line right now that will be thinking about, um, you know, this will, this will prompt them to think more about that. So what, what, how can we prepare? 
Yeah, you know, Deborah, I think it's been fascinating. What the pandemic has unleashed is, as you can see, you know, we've had to we had to show our resilience both as humanity, society, as well as organizations, where literally overnight all of us had to be able to be effective from home. All of us took our laptops and the home became the office. So from a security perspective, your perimeter of your organization became your house and my house, my living room, your living room, because that's where the organization was functioning from. So you've gone from 8,000 employees to 8,000 homes. So not only do we have to protect, we have to protect 8,000 homes because that's where the perimeter has gone. So we saw a series of attacks which have been tried in the past reappear because they had stopped trying those, but now that they're everybody's working from home, there's another opportunity to try and get into people's computers. We saw a variety of scams show up around COVID and PPE. We've seen nation states active trying to get access to data around vaccines and, and cures because everybody's trying to get ahead to make sure they can protect their citizens. So the activity has gone up in this pandemic. And organizations have had to think about a different framework, to your point. And the framework is the perimeter is expanded to your home. The scale needs to be higher in terms of your capacity needs to be higher to be able to process all these digital transactions, which means you have to protect the business uh, more and more. We're seeing a huge shift to the cloud. People have embraced the public cloud, where a lot of organizations are realizing that in the long term, all the data processing is going to happen in the public cloud. So we're seeing a huge shift amongst our customers who are digitally transferring their capabilities and the needs to the cloud. So, so you are seeing network transformations, the home being the perimeter, and cloud transformations that are happening in these times. Yes, indeed. And um, you mentioned the cloud, and I, I, I know that you've recently made some investments in cloud and AI over the past um, two or so years to build out your security product portfolio. Um, how has that actually come into play, uh, especially this year? Yeah, great question, Deborah. You know, what's happened is that I used to work at Google. I spent 10 years over there, and I got a chance to have a front row seat in watching this cloud transformation within a large organization. And I saw how Amazon has pivoted and made sure that they provide the best cloud capability. So did Google, so did Microsoft, and Oracle, and Alibaba, all these companies. And what you realize is that they operate at such scale. There's huge data centers they have around the world, huge capacity, huge bandwidth that they're able to provide that service to organizations like ours and many others where we don't have to worry about building our infrastructure and running it, they do that for us. So we can focus on building the application layers on top and, and sort of going through this transformation faster. So that's that's kind of become the trend where organizations are going to the cloud. And if I was to, you know, I play this game with myself, I go 10 years forward in my mind and look back to see, you know, what could I have thought of, what I couldn't have thought of, and I've you know, done this over the years and, you know, uh, we always tend to underestimate the long term and overestimate the short term. That's what happens. So in the long term, I think 10 years from now, pretty much half of our data is going to be in the public cloud, which means most organizations will have made their transition to the cloud, and we're still in the first innings of it. So we made a conscious bet as an organization to go make investments in protecting our customers in the cloud. And we were early. We acquired five companies. We integrated them today. We're delighted that 1,800 of the top 2,000 organizations in the world uh, so 1,800 uh, of organizations in the world use our services, 73, 73 of the Fortune 100 companies use our services for cloud security. So we're seeing that we did make the right bet from a cloud security perspective. <clears throat> to be honest, the, the second trend which I see, if you go forward 10 years from now and look back, we're just getting started collecting and analyzing a lot of data. I think this decade is going to be the decade of AI. And in that context, you know, I have seen so many amazing ideas, so many amazing companies get started where people are collecting large amounts of data, analyzing it to be able to predict patterns so we can get out of the guessing game. And we made a similar bet. We built a security set of products which work on AI, which work on the collection of data. So those are two big bets and it's early days, but so far so good. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Um, <coughs> now, maybe a bit of an internal look at um, your approach uh, to your people, um, who are uh, arguably your greatest uh, your greatest asset, and that's the 8,000 uh, people, and you're leading them, and many of those tuning in are leading teams through a year like no other, as we've just uh, discussed. Um, how have you tackled this um, at Palo Alto? And then um, I I'd like to touch on uh, the new approach called FlexWork. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that as well. Yeah, you know, Dara, we, uh, <clears throat> when the pandemic hit, uh, some of the companies around us started sending people home. And uh, I was lucky. 
I spent time with the neuroscientist and I asked him, you know, explain to me what's going on right now. What are we dealing with? And he said, <clears throat> like you said, if people are your, your biggest asset. In the context, he said, right now people have high anxiety. High anxiety, which is the fear of the unknown. We don't know when we're going to go back to work. We don't know how vulnerable I am to this pandemic. We don't know what's going to happen. And he said something very interesting. He said, when you go into anxiety mode, it's like imagine being in the jungle, in the dark jungle, where you don't know which animal is going to attack you from which direction. It's like at that point in time, you're, you're in fight or flight mode, in which case you cannot make good decisions and you cannot think long term. So imagine your employees sitting at home, worried about their lives. How are they going to work for you? How are they going to be productive? They're dealing with so much uncertainty. So me and the management team sat down and said, okay, let's focus on eliminating the uncertainty. What do I feel uncertainty about? Uncertainty about when will I go back to work? He said, you don't have to come back to work for six months. Get, start getting used to working from home. Uncertainty whether my job will be there. We told everyone we're not going to fire anyone in the middle of COVID. We will take the hit as a company if you need to, but we're not going to jeopardize anybody's jobs. Uncertainty about well, what if I don't work eight hours a day and I have to take care of my family, my kids, what's going to happen to my job? We said, it doesn't matter how many hours you work in a day. We're not going to penalize you because your job is to make sure you protect your family and take care of everyone. And that, that, that insight about eliminating anxiety allowed us to do so many things in a way where we put our people first and said, this is about your choice, no longer about our choice. So we pivoted the whole company from what we call employer choice to employee choice. And out of that was born this idea of flex work. We can talk about that more. But the, the, the fundamental premise was to give control to our employees. And the fundamental premise was to eliminate anxiety that allows them to do their best work. Mm. It's a very interesting <clears throat> approach. Because it's not normally how companies are run, is it? <laughs> No, you know, we, we've been used to command and control. Come to the office at 9 o'clock, sit there till 5 o'clock. This is your desk. This is when you can eat. This is your lunch time, and these are the meetings. You've got to be in. This is your meeting room. Mm. Um, a, a question I've, I've got for you, actually, is about wh what about new recruits? So, so new people that you have brought into the company during the pandemic, if you have, in fact, hired people, how are they yeah. finding the experience? Because, of course, we're all used to having that kind of camaraderie that you build up in the office and you understand a lot about the culture of an organisation by physically being there and being around the people. And if that's not in, in play, how, how have you dealt with that? That's a, that's an amazing question, Deborah, because that has been one of our challenges, to be honest. And we spent a lot of time uh, packaging a lot of our content digitally. We have phenomenal digital programs now for every employee, not just new ones, but existing employees, where we go through lots and lots of training. Uh, um, I used to do meetings with our teams once a quarter, the whole company. I do them now once a month. I do 50 to 100 groups of employees five times a week. And so just a lot more communication. We assign every new employee a mentor. We check in on them every 30 days, how they're feeling. And finally, you know, what's happened is like 85 to 90% of the people, which is just survey, they say they feel embraced at Palo Alto Networks and they feel like, you know, this is a place they'd like to spend a lot of time at. So, so we, are, we are making that transition, it's hard. I think what's important is people have realized uh, they're getting the best choice amongst all the alternatives out there. Like nobody else has the ability to physically bring you anywhere else. And I have a daughter who's graduating and she's graduating virtually. She doesn't have the opportunity to go graduate like we all did in a large ceremony. So we're all adapting. I think uh, people have realized we're trying our best and then and we're, getting, we're getting credit for that. Yeah, uh, well, nobody uh, wrote a book about this, uh, did they? Um, that's for sure. Yes, um, for sure. So actually, that's um, a really nice segue to to um, my final uh, question for you. And there are some questions coming up, which I will um, have a look at in just a second. But if I could ask you a bit of a global scan and bringing your experience and your insights um, to, to the question around innovation. Um, uh, innovation, do you think enough is being done and... Is there enough investment by governments and are they committing enough to innovation? What's your experience and, and do you think the right level of investments are actually being made, and not just by governments, but perhaps by organisations? Well, you know, uh, Deborah, I have the privilege of, of being in, in a place where this is renowned for the amount of risk taking that is done in Silicon Valley and the amount of investment that goes in. So interestingly, with the pandemic, and the stimulus checks from around the world, you know, money has become. I'm seeing more and more companies getting funded, more and more ideas where people are using 
Now, I, I, I saw two young 19 year old boys. They just we got just got invested in $150 million. They're building a fintech company. Uh, I saw another, my daughter's graduating. She's starting a company. She's 23. So, so I'm seeing a lot more anecdotally and a lot more investment happening. I think the availability of all these platforms and tools where I can rent time by the hour in a data center at Amazon or Google or Microsoft is just, you know, you'd have to build a large data center if you were trying to do that yourself in the past. They, you can literally rent it by the minute by the hour by the workload and you can start building services. So I think the modularization of the building process has definitely accelerated the pace of innovation. I think uh, the, 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 existence of so many success stories. I grew up in India. I grew up in India and at that point in time, there were not that many examples of people starting companies and taking a lot of risk. Today, I'm delighted to see what a thriving, you know, startup ecosystem there is in the country. And we've seen companies which have got valuation in the tens of billions of dollars. And that was not true when I grew up and when I went to college. So you can see China is a huge force. It's in the force not just in China, but in the region where you are in Southeast Asia. People are inspired by some of the phenomenal success stories you've seen come out of China. In Singapore, there's a lot of innovation, Hong Kong. So yeah, Indonesia, you're seeing a lot more grassroots innovation. And also you're seeing that because of the consumerization of technology, that you know young entrepreneurs are coming out of everywhere and getting funded and doing some amazing work. So I just think that the environment, the time is so ripe for phenomenal innovation that's gonna come from the next generation. Remember, you know, I always joke, we're the immigrants to technology, you and I. The technology came after we were born. The my phone didn't exist. Uh, these are the natives. These people have grown up. My, my five-year-old son knows what an iPhone is, and he'll say, you know, he's, he's on Zoom on his Mac. You know? yeah. I had to go rent a computer by the hour when I was 21 in college. Mm. Uh, somebody gave me an example the other day of uh, imagine if you were a, a, a young lawyer, you just graduated, you start your first day on the job and somebody comes and dumps like uh, 50,000 pieces of paper in front of you and says, uh, go, go through, go through all of this. And they're going to say, what, what, what is that? <laughs> I'm sure you did that when you were starting out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there is actually, before, uh, before we uh, get to the end of our session, there is a question here. Um, uh, please suggest what would be a good cyber risk management and transfer approach. For example, cyber risk maturity assessment, cyber insurance, crisis management, et cetera. Ooh, uh, that's a great question. Look, I think uh, the, every one of these things starts with a good cyber risk assessment. Like if you don't know how vulnerable you are, it's very hard to understand the risk and be able to manage it or transfer it. And you know, cybersecurity effectively is risk management. You're trying to make sure that you're protected. Anyway, I, I use the example saying, you know, do you feel protected as a human being when you walk down the street? And then people say, yeah, I carry a baseball bat and I feel protected. Some countries, people carry a gun, but there, I can always think of a scenario where four people showed up with a gun, what are you gonna do? Do you feel protected? Well, not anymore, in which case I'll need four people done. So it really, it really, boils down to how much risk do you believe your business has from a cyber attack. So financial services organizations or medical organizations nowadays have more risk because they have real business critical data and they have business critical processes that are there, which are at risk if they get breached or attacked. You know, a dry cleaner has less risk and a restaurant has less risk than those. Are. So first you have to understand what your risk profile is. Then you have to understand how vulnerable you are. Once you understand your risk profile and your vulnerability, then you can figure out risk mitigation and risk management techniques and they can take on the form of you know, cyber insurance or validating yourself against publicly available models is a way of measuring your risk. Buying insurance is a way of protecting your business against risks. And making sure you have a great cybersecurity posture is a way of mitigating that risk. Yes, indeed. Well, the timer is telling me that we only have uh, less than two minutes. So um, what I thought I would ask you, um, if you had, uh, if you uh, were given one minute, which I'm about to give you, and there were three things that you wanted to leave this audience uh, with today, what would they, what would they be? I think, look, the number one thing is that uh, it's a phenomenal time in our lives. I know we are all... Uh, thinking about life from a pandemic perspective, at least we are in the US because we just got shut down over here, but it's a phenomenal time. We have shown that we as mankind, humankind can be very resilient. The whole world is adapted on a dime. We've all figured out a way 
to be innovative in these times, to be effective. Look at this, we're conducting a, a, a an event, which had I said to you two years ago, is all gonna be virtual and thousands of people will dial in and you will be having a conversation. This we would have said it's impossible. So the, the resilience and our, our innovative capabilities are phenomenal. So there's there's lots of hope out there. Let's go out there and, and be innovative. Let's go out and take a positive attitude. And as I said earlier, that the second message I'll give you, we're in the next golden era of tech again, because what this pandemic has proven that digitization, the enablement of tech is only going to accelerate in our lives. And that is going to bring out both opportunity as well as phenomenal capabilities and services for us. So I think those are my two messages as, as we come to an end that uh, be hopeful and go out and innovate. Yes, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Nikesh Arora from Palo Alto Networks. It's been my pleasure to uh, talk to you today. Uh, thank you very much to all of those at the Singapore FinTech Festival. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Deborah, for a phenomenal job. And thank you, Deborah, for that, as well as uh, Nikesh for that really insightful talk. Uh, definitely lots to do in the cybersecurity space as the pandemic uh, accelerates the pace of digital transformation. Now, of course, uh, what Nikesh has also talked about, human capital, it's one issue. Uh, no secret that organizations globally do face a growing shortage of cybersecurity professionals as well. The threats we face in cyberspace today from thieves, attempting to clone identities, carrying out fraud to political disinformation campaigns designed to alter the course of democracies. It will only become more intense unless there are sufficient people with the skills to counter that coming through the pipeline. Now, without investing in training existing staff on how to prevent or mitigate cyber attacks in their field, as well as hiring experts with the skills to spot new threats on the horizon, the industry stands to lose hundreds of millions of dollars. Thank you.